chapter 12, verses 27 through 36. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Now, as we look at this passage, we need to remember that Jesus had just been approached by two of his disciples, Philip and Andrew. And they had brought word to him that there were certain Greeks who wanted to see him. Now, Jesus immediately recognized the request as an indication that his time had arrived. His time, I I was sharing with you, is his appointed time, the appointed time to give up his life. That, That appointed time for his crucifixion has finally arrived, and he's going to be glorified. And the way he's going to be glorified is through his death, because when he dies, his death will produce a harvest of believers. And and we know that to be what would be called God's plan of redemption. In Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11, it says, It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And so God's plan of redemption was for Jesus to bear the iniquities of people that they might come to faith in him and have a relationship with God. So Jesus is about to give up his life, and he's doing so voluntarily. No one took his life from him. He of his own will laid it down. So because he is voluntarily laying down his life, those who follow him are to be prepared to renounce anything, anything that keeps them from the Lord. In Mark 8, 35 through 37, Jesus said it like this. He said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Then he asked the question, what will it profit a man If he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He's about to lay his life down voluntarily, and his followers are to be prepared to renounce anything that keeps them from him. And so in verse 26, he said, if anyone serves me, let him him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. And he went on to say, if anyone serves me, him my father will honor So honor from the Father is to be chosen over any earthly honor we might receive from man. That is a very important thing to always remember because sometimes the Lord may elevate you to a position of prominence and you can get caught up with that position of prominence and forget to honor the Lord. We need to remember that no matter what it is or what we have, what kind of positions we may have that that the most important thing for us is to remember to to choose to honor the Lord above anything else. Because when we seek honor from man, we may be rejecting honor from the Lord. In John 5.44, the question is asked, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? How can you? How can you believe when you're seeking man's praise rather than God's? That's why Philippians 2 verse 3 says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. 
And so Jesus is here and he's speaking in verse 27 and he says, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. He says, my soul, the word soul in the original language, the Greek language is the word suke. And suke speaks of the mind. It's the seat of all natural feelings and emotions. I'm troubled, agitated. When he says I'm troubled, that means to be anxious or distressed. I, I'm disturbed, disquieted. I'm restless. And so when he says that, my soul is troubled, his words reveal a resistance to the idea of a violent death. He came for that purpose, but it's difficult for him to go through it. So what am I to do? What am I to do? Am I to pray that God will save me from having to die? Well, this is interesting. This being the last week of his ministry on earth, um, this is something that you see a similar thing uh, once again later on when Jesus is in Gethsemane. Uh, Mark tells us that Jesus experienced agony while he was in the garden. In Mark 14, 34, he told Peter, James, and John, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Then he went on to say in verses 35 and 36, uh, Mark says he, he went a little farther, fell on the ground, prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. My soul is troubled, he says. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. And later on, he was praying there in that garden. And then Luke reminds us, and the, the physician Luke says that he was sweating, as it were, great, great droplets of blood. He was in that kind of anxiety, that kind of stress, that kind of, of, of agony. And uh, he was praying that same kind of thing, but he, he is already prepared when he said, my soul is troubled, but what shall I say save me? Because he goes on to say, this purpose I came to the hour. I came for this purpose. I know, Jesus is saying, my purpose. I know why I came. I, I came to do just this, to die. I came to lay my life down. In Matthew 20, 18 and 19, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests, to the scribes. They will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles, to mock, to scourge, to crucify. But he went on to say, in the third day, he will rise again. What am I to say, Lord, save me from this hour? No. For this purpose, I came to this hour. I'm going to be rejected, Jesus says. I'm going to be put to death. That's because he's what is called the wounded healer. That's because he understands man. He goes through the things that man goes through. He's aware of our sorrows. Isaiah 53, verse 3, he's despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. So should I attempt to avoid laying down my life in this fashion? No, because this is why I've come. This is why I came in the first place. In Hebrews 2, verse 10, it says it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So in doing my Father's will, I'm looking past the crucifixion to the future, to the fruit, to the glory. The psalmist in Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8 said, wrote, Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it's written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. So this joy of laying his life down in order that he might be reunited with his father and that he might bring many people to, uh, to heaven with him is what motivated him. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so he says, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Save me. But for this purpose I came. Then he goes into verse 28 and he says, Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Glorify your name. Jesus obviously is praying that 
that the Lord might receive glory, that his Father might be glorified. In Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, Paul said, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so he says, Father, glorify your name. And notice verse 28 again, a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This isn't the first time we read in Scripture of God's voice ringing out from the heavens. When Jesus was baptized, it's recorded in Matthew 3.17 that suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You read in Mark chapter 9, verse 7 at, at what is called the transfiguration, where it says a cloud came and overshadowed them. A voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved Son hear him. Well, here we once again have an example of, of the Lord speaking. A voice came from heaven saying, I, be, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. In other words, I have glorified it in the past. I will, I will glorify myself in the future. And it will be especially uh, 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 something that, that will happen will especially bring glory to me. And that is when Jesus goes to the cross and when he's resurrected. Somebody wrote, his life revealed the mercy, love, and majesty of the Father and had to many glorified the Father's name. His upcoming death and resurrection will reveal God's character and therefore glorify the Father's name to the entire world. Well, as this is taking place, he's saying, my soul is troubled. Father, glorify your name. And then this voice comes and says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Notice what happens. Verse 29, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken. And so they're listening and they hear, but they don't get it. When it says the people, uh, the word people there, you might find this interesting if you take notes. It is interesting. The word the people is really speaking of a multitude. A great amount of people is what it's speaking about, not just two or three people. It's speaking about a great amount. The people is a, is a crowd. So within this crowd, within the multitude of people, some hear the voice. And I want to speak on this for just a moment. Some hear the voice, but to them it's a natural phenomenon. To them, it's something like thunder. They hear the sound, but it's natural to them. It's like, it's like, like they say it. Well, some are saying it thundered. It's just a natural thing. But others hear it, and they attach spiritual significance to it. They say, an angel spoke to him. Now, in order to understand that, we need to remember that at this time, uh, there, were, uh, there, was, there were rabbinic teachings related to angels and all, and uh, there were those who, who thought that God did not speak to men, but instead would do so through the, through the agency of angels. You see that in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, where the writer says the message spoken through angels was binding. In Galatians 3.19, it says the law was given through angels and trusted to a mediator. And so there was a common belief at that time amongst many people through the rabbinic teachings that uh, God himself wouldn't speak, but angels would do it. And that's one of the reasons why they're attaching spiritual significance to this. They're saying an angel has spoken to him. What's interesting is you have, on the one hand, people who are just very natural, just natural people. They're just natural, unspiritual people. And you have others who have a bit of a spiritual understanding. So on the one hand, you have someone say, well, it's just thundering. On the other hand, you have people say, no, an angel is speaking to him. And I find that interesting to see that contrast by way of application. People can hear the same words, but still not understand what's being communicated. They can hear God's voice as the word is taught, but they think it's just that guy's opinion. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't hear what's being said. You, you can go to a Bible study, a, a church service, and uh, as an unbeliever, and you hear the same words that, that the person next to you is hearing. Same words. You hear the same story. You hear everything, 
the same. And yet an invitation is given. And one guy remains in his seat because he's saying in his own heart, it thundered. It's a natural thing. This guy's eloquent, perhaps. He's intelligent, perhaps. He's got opinions, perhaps. Whatever. He's thinking, well, no, that's true. That may be true. That may not be true. And so this message is being given, and one person is sitting there saying, you know, when is this over? i got to get going, whatever, because they're the natural man. Then you have somebody else in the same place listening, saying, that's the voice of God. There's something spiritual about what's taking place. It happens every time I teach, every time. There are people who are seated there who say, it's just thunder. It's just words. It's just noise. There are others who are saying, well, there's something spiritual here. An angel spoke. The interesting thing, and I want you to notice this, is verse 28. Because in verse 28, it says, A voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. John heard the voice. John heard the words. One person saying, an angel speaking. Another one saying, thunder. But John is telling us. And this gives us insight. There's the natural man who rejects the things of the Spirit of God. There's the spiritual-minded person who can pick up bits and pieces of it. And then there's a person who knows the Lord who says, this is exactly what he said. So you see that in, this, in these two verses here. They hear the same thing, but some understand because the Holy Spirit made it clear to them. In 1 Corinthians 2.14 and I'm using what is called the New Living Translation because it, it reads easier. It says, people who aren't Christians can't understand these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them because only those who have the Spirit can understand what the Spirit means. And that's true. That's true. Only those with the Spirit of the Lord can understand what God is saying. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness, foolishness to them. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. That's what 1 Corinthians 2.14 says. The natural man. The natural man is the unspiritual man, the non-Christian. The natural man, the person who doesn't have the Spirit of God, the natural man doesn't receive. The word receive in the Greek language doesn't welcome, doesn't accept, doesn't invite in. The natural man, the unspiritual man, does not welcome in, does not invite in the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they are foolishness to him. The word foolishness means imbecilic or moronic. They make no sense. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness. Neither can he know them. He doesn't have personal experience with them. Why? Because they're spiritually received. A believer can hear a Bible study, and, and, and it is deep calling to deep. There's words of truth, and as they listen to the Bible being explained, the Holy Spirit takes the words, and, uh, and as they're listening, they have this, this um, connection to what's being said, and they say, I get it, I see it, I understand that. That's true, because God takes his word, and he knits it in your heart when you receive it by faith. But a person who doesn't know the Lord, they don't receive it. Well, you know that, you know, I admire you Christians. You know, I think that you do good. It's nice that you have charities, and I'm, I'm glad that you guys had orphanages, and I realize that you guys started colleges and, and that you're, you're behind, uh, you know, all so many acts of mercy hospitals. They came from your faith, and there's quite a number of things that the Christian, Christianity brought into the world that people take for granted and didn't even realize that it was because of our love for Christ that we actually started the Red Cross, that we actually had the first universities in the United States, and the first universities, Harvard and Princeton and Yale, the first universities uh, were started in order to train uh, ministers of the gospel to go out and reach the indigenous peoples and to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. Most people don't know that because they have forgotten their history. They have forgotten Princeton used to be that it was, was, was actually a seminary, Princeton, and it became what it is today. All we know of Princeton, Harvard, Yale, and all of the Ivy League schools now uh, is we just know that they put out a lot of very brilliant atheists and agnostics. But in their origin, they were training people to take the gospel to the world. That's why they were started, to 
reach people with the message of Christ. They have forgotten their history. They have forgotten why they even began in the first place. You see? And so there are people who, who are kind of like, they, they, they nod in appreciation towards believers because perhaps they're educated to realize that that hospitals and, and, and orphanages and, and charitable institutions and all of that, they, they were really originated with Christians who cared about the hurt and the orphans. And how do we take care of them? So we did welfare. We helped them. Not welfare as you know it here in the United States, but we helped, we, we helped them to, to, to live, to survive, to be, to be trained. And, and that's, that's what the church has always done. So somebody sits and they listen to what's being said and they say, well, you know, that makes some sense and all of that. Uh, but it, it's still, still looked at as being, well, it's just a philosophy. And, and they'll say things like, you know, atheists can do good things too and, and Buddhists can and so can uh, Muslims and also what makes yours any better than theirs? And, and they'll, they'll, they'll say that, you know, it thundered. And then there's others who say, well, no, an angel spoke, you know. There's some spiritual truth to this. There's a quality of truth that's spiritual, not natural. But John, because he knows Jesus, is able to say, no, this is what he said. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So you have three different types of responses, a natural, kind of a spiritual, and uh, our, our one that's spirit, spiritually led and taught, which is John. And John makes it very clear that God is saying, I glorified it and I will glorify it again. And so as this is taking place, verse 30, Jesus answered. And he said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Uh, I, I don't need any audible confirmation. I already know what I'm here for, but you needed to hear this. This, this voice you're hearing, this sound you're hearing, is confirming my ministry. This voice really is for your benefit, not mine. And maybe that those Greeks who had wanted to see Jesus, maybe those Greeks uh, who were present needed such a sign. And so he says, this is why it is. It's for your sake and not for mine. And so in verse 31, now, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And this he said, signifying by what death he would die. Now is the judgment of this world. That, that word judgment, when you look up its meaning, it speaks of a decision that has been given, especially concerning justice or injustice or that which is right or that which is wrong. A decision concerning justice, injustice, or the right or wrong. It, it, the point is the, the world is about to condemn itself by the way that it treats Jesus. The world is about to put God's son to death thus rejecting their only way to salvation. In John 3, 18 and 19, Jesus said, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They, they like the darkness because the darkness hides their deeds. It hides it. You know, crimes are committed 24-7, of course. But many people prefer the darkness to commit their crimes in. Sin happens all the time, 24-7. Many people prefer the darkness to engage in their sins. And so people love the darkness. And that's what it is. They, God, they're going to be putting God's son to death they're rejecting their only way to salvation. So judgment has come. And notice he says, the ruler of this world will be cast out. And so when he says the ruler, that word ruler is also translated chief or leader. So the ruler, the chief, the leader of this world will be, notice, cast out. So in verse 31, Satan is referred to as a prince, a ruler, and uh, this was actually what has been called a rabbinic title for Satan, the prince of this age or the prince of this world. Satan is the ruler, Jesus said. The devil who has so long reigned and enslaved mankind, Jesus is saying, is about to be dethroned. 
Now, Satan received authority when he deceived Eve and Adam voluntarily sinned. It says in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, that when Jesus was being tempted, that the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Through his deception, he got a position where he could even say to Jesus, this has been given to me. It was yielded to me, and I have authority. I can use it. Jesus, in John 14, 30, says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has nothing in me. And in 1 John 5, 19, John said it like this. He said, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. He's called the prince of this age, the prince of the world. There are those who say they don't believe in the devil. But Jesus most certainly spoke to him and spoke because he is real. And he's speaking about him being dealt with. He's to be dethroned. You know, Satan's goal is to keep mankind in spiritual blindness, to continue to encourage people to reject Jesus' offer of salvation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, Even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. It's veiled. The enemy wants to keep us in spiritual blindness. He wants to keep us in spiritual bondage. But Jesus says Satan is about to be dethroned. He's about to be deprived of the power he exercises in the hearts of unbelievers. You see, the sacrifice of Jesus and the message of the gospel sets captives free. And he's about to give a basis for the judgment of the world, the overthrowing of Satan, the establishment of his kingdom through his followers. And so he says in verse 32, he said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. When I first got saved... That scripture was first introduced to me, but it was misinterpreted. And for a long time, you know, when you're when you're new, I'll put it this way: when you're a new Christian and you're reading the Bible, you might get something you think is some kind of wonderful insight or revelation, when in fact you're just misreading the scripture. And so, my friends, we were all brand new Christians. I mean, the oldest person amongst us in the Lord uh, was a year old in in faith. I remember being at a Bible study where this young woman uh, said, today is my spiritual birthday. I'm one year old in Jesus. And, and I was seated there, and, and I was only a month and a half old in Jesus. And I was thinking, wow. It was like I was looking at the apostle Paul, you know, Pauline. And, as, and I'll never forget that. I was thinking, man, what's it going to be like when I've been a Christian a whole year? A whole year. And so, you know, babies are interesting. When babies try to feed one another, you ever watch a baby try and feed another baby? It's very humorous, except to the mom who has to clean them up. Because I have seen it where an infant will just take their little hand in whatever, the applesauce, and then try and put it in the mouth of the baby next to him. Have you ever seen it? I have. You know, and then the other one will do that. Their faces are all messed up and filled with applesauce and all of that. Babies feeding babies always make a mess. And when young believers are trying to feed other believers, we can make a mess. And so there I was getting some applesauce in my face, you know, because they're saying, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And then they said, so that's what we're doing right now. We're singing and worshiping and praying and we're lifting him up. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. What Jesus said, if I be lifted up, what he is meaning is when I'm crucified. He was lifted up onto the cross. And when I am crucified, when I am put to death, when I die for the sin of the whole world, is what he's re referring to. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, it's the crucifixion, it's the death of Christ that draws people. When I'm crucified, though it appears I lost, yet I will be victorious. And by it, by my death, I will draw people to myself. You see, the Holy Spirit draws people to Christ 
through the preaching of the cross. We make a big mistake when we think we can entertain people into salvation. We make a big mistake when we think we can sing them into salvation. The way you get saved is not by being entertained. We know this. We aren't saved because we like that song. We're saved because the gospel of Jesus was proclaimed to us. And it's the gospel that sets us free. In 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. And so we make a big mistake when we don't preach the gospel. We make a big mistake when we substitute man's inventive kinds of ideas and we pollute that. I'll be teaching this on Sunday. Mixing man's wisdom with, with our philosophy and producing people who believe what we're saying but not God himself. It's the gospel that saves you. It's the word of God. We need to understand that today. It's the gospel, it's the truth of the gospel that purifies minds. It's the truth of the gospel that illuminates darkened understanding. In Psalm 36, verse 9, it says, With you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And so Jesus said, I will be lifted up, and I will draw all people to myself. And it says in verse 33, this he said, signifying by what death he would die. Well, verse 34, the people answered him, We've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? And Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Well, we've heard, they say in verse 34, that Christ is to remain. When he says we've heard from the law, that speaks of the normally the first five books of the Old Testament, which is referred to as the law of Moses. But here it appears to have a broader meaning. It it, it speaks of Scripture in general. You see, in Daniel 7, 14, it it, it says, uh, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Well, we've heard that, that when Messiah comes, that, that he's going to continue, that he remains forever. So they had drawn the conclusion that Messiah cannot die because Scripture said his throne, kingdom, and reign shall be eternal. So they're confused. And that's why in verse 35... Jesus said, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light. You see, Jesus, who is the light of life, is going to give up his life for them. And the darkness, according to verse 35, the darkness desires to dominate, to suddenly seize and control you. So walk in the light so that you can see where you're going and be free. And be free. He says in verse 35, he who walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. In, in John eleven ten, 10, if, if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light's not in him. In Romans 13, 12 through 14, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. And so Jesus is saying this, verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. While you have the light, believe. While you have me, follow me. When you have the light, believe in the light. Either you're walking in darkness or you're walking in the light. But you don't do it simultaneously. Either you walk in darkness, habitually living a life of spiritual darkness, 
or you come to faith in Jesus Christ and you learn to walk in his light. When you walk in his light as he is in the light, then you have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his sin cleanses you from all sin. So you have fellowship with God and one another. Your life is pure and you have a relationship that is centered on Christ. And so Jesus is making it very clear, soon this light will be taken. He's about to be crucified, but you need to believe in him. To believe in him is going to make you into what is called a child or children of the light. So instead of being children of darkness, you're going to be children of the light. And uh, one thing about light and darkness is under normal circumstances, they don't coexist. Because if you want to drive darkness out, all you need to do is turn on a light, right? You go into your room and it's dark. All you need to do is turn on a light. And when you turn on the light, you know, in a metaphoric way, you turn on the light and the darkness flees. Because darkness cannot exist where there's light. So we have to make a choice, guys. Am I going to walk in the light as he is in the light? Or am I going to walk in darkness? I can't do both. So I make a decision. The decision is, I will walk in the light. I will follow Christ. I will have relationship with him. Jesus laid his life down for me, and I will follow him. 